Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Koto Katoa. We're going to kick off shortly with a video which will take you through the process that we have been under to develop our draft 2050 roadmap, which you have on the tables in front of you. We'll then move through to a question format from our panel. New Zealand has signed up to lowering our emissions, and this will mean changes for Taranaki's economy. As a region, we want to be proactive about this transition, which is why we have developed a Taranaki 2050 roadmap to ensure we keep Taranaki a great place to live, work, play and create. Businesses, organisations and individuals from across Taranaki have come together to share their ideas and visions for our region in a low emissions future. We held 29 workshops on key themes with over 700 participants. It was great to be a part of the 2050 workshop. The workshops were absolutely fantastic. Inspirational people and that's what it was. Come 2050, if we can see the likes of the Waiwakaiha River like this, I would be stoked. We surveyed more than 280 people about their personal views. So it's just really how we're going to get there. We'll really be a vibrant place um, for us who live here and others that want to visit. Our communities to be really working together. The youth workshop was inspiring. And got the creative ideas of hundreds of Taranaki school children. Overall, I found the workshop was very worthwhile. And here is what we have come up with together for our future. The future for Taranaki is going to be really great. So I'll just quickly outline a little bit about our process and also the lessons that we've learnt along the way. From the video you can see that one of the key things we did was engage our youth, so they have contributed their thoughts and ideas to this roadmap. And most importantly, this roadmap has been a ground up process. So we started with a blank sheet of paper and we asked people what it was that people would like to see in a low emissions future in 2050. We gathered a range of diverse views and sometimes that can be an uncomfortable space. What was also important in the process was to relinquish control. So this was about, as I said, the views of the community and building that ground up view. What was also important for us was having a partnership with MB and they provided a whole lot of resource which have supported us to get to where we are now. We also developed some kawa or how we were going to go about this work and our key principle underpinning all of our work was one of manaakitanga and caring for each other through this process. We also had some ground rules in terms of conversations that were for another time. So it was, our framing was very much about transitioning to a low emissions economy. Our roadmap that you have in front of you today is a draft. It's now online at taranaki2050.org.nz and we have there an interactive feedback tool. So this is now the opportunity for other people who haven't yet had an opportunity to have a say, to be involved and to share their thoughts about our roadmap. In terms of some of the lessons that we've learned along the way, really importantly, diversity of thought adds value and strength. It can be challenging, but the rewards are well worth it. We didn't engage with iwi and Māori as much as we would have liked to um, for a range of reasons, um, timing, logistics, capacity, capability, uh, and that is something that we want to continue to grow and build further. Really importantly, what was interesting across that diversity of thought is that as a community, we have some really strong values that are shared and that connect and underpin our roadmap. I talked a little bit about this being a ground up process. And so ceding some of that control can be a little bit scary, but it need not be. One of the other lessons that we have learned is that people might have perceptions about these kinds of processes and it can actually be quite hard to communicate and get over those perceptions. 
So people um, may have thought that because we called some things working groups, we had perceptions that people felt they had to be invited to come along, um, which they didn't have to be, anybody could come along. We also had some perceptions that people thought that, again, because they, it was an open thing, that then they were perhaps maybe too important to come, so they didn't come. Um, but that's why we had a whole range of other mechanisms to try and engage people, and as I've said, that's why we are also seeking more feedback now. One of the other challenges we had was just around um, collecting the demographics of who had participated in the process so far and tracking attendance. I'd now like to hand over to Grant McCoy, who's going to take us through our panel discussion. Thank you, Justin. So our panel is made up of representatives of the lead group, and the panel actually represents the five pillars of the lead group. So that was business, workers, Maori, the community, and local and central government. And to my left, we have Wade Crockett, CEO of the South Taranaki District Council, Gus Charteris, who is the general manager of the Just Transition Unit of the Ministry of Business, Innovation, and Employment, Justine Gilliland, who's the CEO of Venture Taranaki. Joanna Breer, who's the CEO of Todd Energy. Jen Natoli, who's the team lead for ETU. Mm -hmm. Glenn Bennett, our community representative. And Fadehoka Wano, who's the CEO of Taranaki Iwi. What we're actually gonna do is, we've asked for some community questions prior to this, and we're gonna run Slido polling, both for the audience who's here today, but also the online and access radio people who are participating. And so we encourage you to vote on those questions as we put them up. So the Q&A will actually be available for people to look at on their phones. Now, because the questions are actually shrunk or only partially visible on your phone, and we wanted to involve as much as the community as possible, so including people who couldn't attend today, I'm just going to read through the questions for the benefit of those who might be participating via radio. So, question number one, which is actually from Emily Bailey of Climate Justice Taranaki. How do you think this plan will support the rural farming communities in Taranaki to become sustainable and rebuild rural populations again? Question number two is, can we remove and rebuild smarter, efficient, or are we more likely to favour renovation? That's from Gary Wyborn of Computer Safety Systems. Question number three, from Gina Blackburn of Now My Tours. What mechanisms will be put in place to ensure the core principles of the Treaty of Waitangi, partnership, protection, and participation are both honored and championed in Taranaki? Question number four, how can we ensure regional and national strategies are aligned and continued across consecutive governments? Julia Ord of Customer Connect. Number five, how does opening up more oil and gas permits next year and beyond help us reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Stuart Bramhall of Climate Justice Taranaki. And question number six from Dion Cowley of New Plymouth District Council. Is there currently enough of a focus on children given they are going to drive this transition and inherit the world we create? So as I mentioned, we encourage people to um, vote towards those questions and we'll look to answer one or two of those towards the end of uh, our panel discussion. Now, just working through, what we have on the screen is the draft roadmap that's actually been created as an outcome of the process. As you can see, there's been a lot captured into a single visual image. So, Justine, just wondering if you could take us through how you read the roadmap. Sure. That's right. I will just try and use the, the pointer here. So with the roadmap, you start, is this good enough? Sorry, I'll stand here and mm -hmm. hopefully not fall off. There we are. So if we start, oh dear, anyway, okay. So we start in the bottom left corner of the roadmap and that represents where we are today. As a region, we are a net contributor to New Zealand in terms of GDP and prosperity. And that is something that we want to continue. We also have illustrated there Tapairo, which is our current regional economic development strategy. And that strategy lays some really important platforms for where we go in the future. 
we have our drivers of change and the little cloud on the left hand side. And those are drivers that are going to be blowing through our region over the foreseeable future. We then have our emerging pathways, these shaded blue lines. These are the pathways for us to get to our vision and they represent 12 topics that we think or areas that are important for Taranaki's economy. The rest of the picture portrays our really rich vision for Taranaki in 2050. Some of the things included in that vision are diversification of our economy to net zero, remaining a net contributor to New Zealand, having seamless, path seamless pathways between education and employment and an ongoing learning framework, having a rich innovation system and continuing to have a high value food chain. So, Whareha uh, if we just pass, pass it down there. When you look at the roadmap, what stands out for you? What do you see? E tino pia tata. Tuatahi e mihi ana ki a tata. Look, I, I suppose um, I, I was one of the few that attended um, uh, the, the Māori economy uh, workshops, one held down in Aotearoa Marae in, in South Taranaki, one up at Ōhai Marae, so just trying to sort of capture a lot of the values. And, and as I understand, a lot of the values were captured um, and, and through, through all of the engagements, it was really good to hear the Prime Minister talk this morning about kaitiaki tanga. Um, so some of those Māori values were, were really surfaced and you'll see them at the top of that road map. Um, kaitiaki tanga, manaki tanga, and um, kotahi tanga. So, you know, the, the, the values that we, you know, why we may say they're Māori values, they're actually values we share um, as a whole community, they're generic, and they're things we do. And as the Prime Minister talked rightly about, kaitiaki tanga, um, one of the, the, the workshop that I, I was at, we coined the phrase, ora te whenua, ora te tangata. Um, it was often an old phrase, actually, when we, our, our land was confiscated, and one of our, one of our tūpuna said, mate te whenua, mate te tangata, when the, fa the, the, the whenua is gone, then we become un unhealthy as a people. So we've turned it around to a positive. When the land's healthy, the, uh, you know, we are healthy as a people. So it's, it's something that we are really asking and encouraging, more than just encouraging, but insisting that for us to live as, as people of Taranaki, we must look after our environment. That kaitiaki tanga, when we go to the beach, uh, when we do uh, those sorts of activities that we like to do. Um, I love surfing. I love my kaimoana. Uh, and I know when I go to my different um, locations where I get my kai, and I'm not going to tell you where I go, <laughs> because there's still lots of kai there, but there are different times when the rivers run high, when algae farming kicks in, and I can't go onto my reefs. So, um, you know, that's that kaitiaki tanga we talk about. It's something that we all um, need to understand. Manaki tanga, um, it's, a, it's a, a value that we all understand. I think it's really, it's a community value. It's about caring for our community. Uh, caring, um, and not only caring for our community, but serving our community. It's about, it's mana enhancing. So how do we ensure that all sectors of our community are acknowledged? Uh, as I saw in, in the workshops that I went to, we had a certain demographic at those workshops, but not always our marae people, our people on the ground. And that's, the, that's who we have to capture in terms of manaki tanga to ensure we hear their voice. Kotahi tanga. Uh, that's always an interesting one here within Māoridom. Uh, we are many tribes, we are many marae, we are many hapu, um, and sometimes when you engage with us, you just want to go and talk to one person. Uh, good luck to you. Um, but, you know, we, it, it really is important um, that you're engaging with men, all the sectors of Māoridom. And when we talk about kotahi tanga unity, um, within Taranaki, we've, we're diverse. We're Māori, we're Pākehā, we're urban, we're rural. There's even a bit of a line between north and south, they tell me. <laughs> um, so, you know, how do we in ensure um, that we are um, a, a, a unified community and we're dealing with some of these big issues that we're going to face in terms of low emission? Kia kaha tato ki te hoi. Thank you. Um, Jean, when you look at the draft roadmap, what stands out for you? Morena koutou. Um, first of all, Totoko 
your, uh, your cordial, um, there's a lot that stands out that resonates for our community and working people who are here. If you look toward the bottom of the roadmap, what you'll see is the thing that strikes me first, the concept of justice. This is a just transition to a low emissions economy. Too often, working people, their fauna, their communities have borne the cost of transitioning, whether economic or social or otherwise. And they're the least able to bear those costs. So we're building something different here, and that's our vision. What we're designing is a transition that is just and fair, where working people are at the table, designing their own transition, and supported through that transition so that the entire community is successful and grows. Um, where no one is left behind, even those currently disaffected by our current economic system. Where we can reconcile our past, grow our cultural awareness, and move on together as one. Um, so there's a lot packed into this roadmap. And if you have a look at the top, you'll see it talks about enterprise on right next to the sun near the top of the map. There's a lot of little pictures in the map that also demonstrate this. Just under the sun, you'll see a worker holding a lollipop sign. Um, and just to the left of that, you'll see workers with a robot talking. So importantly, in those images, I see technology being used to augment, not replace, work. That means that investments in technology that economists last century predicted would result in working people maintaining their incomes, but actually working less hours per work per week, will actually result in a greater work-life balance and lifestyle for the people who this is all about, our youth, our tamariki. Um, and that's important for enterprise here, and it means we need to diversify our economy so that we're not reliant solely on high emissions, um, so that we can move forward together. I also see, um, if you look in the middle of the photograph, or the map, um, you will see workers putting, installing solar panels. Um, and what I see is inclusive, well-paid, meaningful jobs where workers are upskilled and developed and passionate about the work they do right here in Taranaki. This kind of support through a transition is a model not only for our country, but also the world right now. And I see workers having benefited from what we start now in 2019 so that they can achieve an even better lifestyle and work-life balance in 2050. Sustainability is another part that Fari already mentioned, but it's about meeting the needs of the present without compromising what our future needs will be and our future generations. So throughout our 29 hui around our region, the Taranaki lifestyle came through extremely strongly. Our people want to have enough income to enjoy their natural environment and the outdoor activities that we all love and we all greatly value, that if we're gonna enjoy them, then we need the time with the people we love and the means to take that opportunity. That's the vision that I wanna see become a reality. Thank you, Jim. And I think a really strong point was the alignment of aspiration across all of the participants. And I think that came through really loud and clear. Uh, Glenn, when we look at the uh, draft roadmap, there are a number of emerging themes that came through. Do you want to talk to those? Mm, mm. Um, Atamaria, uh, thank you. Uh, I was privileged enough to be part of running, facilitating a number of those workshops, so got to be uh, there at the at the grass, grassroots level. But in terms of uh, what Fadi and Jen have already talked about, that connected, connectedness uh, and inclusivity, I think, was a huge one that came out. And you look at the roadmap, obviously, it's so busy and got so much on it. Um, but if you look under um, our beautiful Maungo, you'll see um, around sustainability of our environment, um, the flourishing uh, flora and fauna, and also people connected around our beautiful Maungo. Everyone is, uh, <laughs> I guess, pivots towards um, that beautiful mountain. Also around housing, sustainable housing was one, and I think very much what came out and what's on here is, is almost looking back to go forward in terms of um, papakainga, co-housing, you know, how communities um, live, breathe, work, and, and share uh, is, is actually going, looking back at what used to be to, to, to move forward in terms of our connectedness. Um, education about being more flexible uh, and in a changing environment where things are, um, who knows what our schools will look like in 2050. 
Um, but it's a fast and changing world, so how can they be flexible uh, and, and move with those times? Also around, as Jen's talked about, jobs, uh, in, in terms of there, where people are, are paid a fair wage. Um, but there are alternative jobs, jobs um, that obviously are around a low emissions economy. And I guess finally, in terms of, of the space on there, it's, it's a region that looks out and cares for itself, um, for its people, and for its environment. And I guess it comes back to that connected connectedness and that inclusivity, um, but that we are actually caring. Uh, and I was part of, uh, we had a river exercise that we ran. Uh, so at every workshop there was a, a piece of blue uh, ribbon that represented the river, and people were asked to bring things that reflected what was important to them around, about Taranaki, about our future, what is something that they hold dear and close to them about our region. And interestingly enough, if you're from business, if you're from community, if you're from iwi, whoever you came from, it always felt like it was the same. Uh, it was around our environment, it was around being connected, uh, it was around fresh water, um, being able to eat the kaimawana, uh, being able to be connected to nature, but also being able to be paid fair wages. And so I guess that really encouraged me in terms of the process, um, that we, we all kind of have the same vision of where we want to go, um, but I guess it's the how we get there. Thank you. So this, this draft roadmap was about a transition for Taranaki. So when we look at this, Wade, what do you see that stands out as being uniquely Taranaki? Yeah, kia ora tato. Um, the, uh, just building on the back of what Fuddy, uh, Glenn and uh, Jen have already talked about, there's a, there's a whole range of things that are unique about Taranaki um, um, that are uh, put forward in the, in the uh, roadmap we have in front of us. Probably a couple of key themes though, environment, culture, um, our people and um, the infrastructure that is already currently in place is the first. Um, in terms of the environment, there's nothing more unique about Taranaki than the Maunga through to the, uh, to the, to through to the Moana um, uh, mount mountain to the sea. Um, and all of the ecosystems that sit um, around um, Mount Taranaki. Um, we also have a very rich and deep culture uh, within uh, Taranaki and it's really important for us to, to never lose sight of that, to make sure that that's carried forward um, in everything that we do. Um, our people, uh, there are skills and talent um, within Taranaki that are only available and uh, uh, perhaps seen in this part of the world, and we need to continue to develop that um, and also look at how that might diversify into new technologies in the future and how we train and bring people through, and so that comes to some of the things that Jen's already uh, um, talked about uh, just previously as well, and train people, get that new skills, get that new talent going, um, and some new innovations and some new opportunities going forward. Uh, from the infrastructure point of view, um, there is already a considerable amount of infrastructure uh, within the Taranaki region. Can it be repurposed? Can it be re renovated, reused for other new technologies or other purposes uh, moving forward in the future as well. Um, I do just have one other, uh, very uh, quickly, one last point as well, which is about the economy. Um, obviously, listening to the previous presentation that James and Susie presented, uh, very thought-provoking uh, concepts and things coming through in that presentation as well. Um, we also need to recognise that uh, Taranaki has been built on the back of some very significant agricultural and oil and gas industry over a number of years, it's really, really important to not lose sight of that, but to continue to look at how we might move forward and diversify from that at a pace that's good. Thank you. Um, Joanna, if we look at the roadmap, this process that we went through was Taranaki, but it's a process that will apply across New Zealand and has relevance to the rest of the world. So how does this roadmap connect in with the rest of New Zealand? Uh, Marena, thanks Grant. Look, when I look at the roadmap, I see so much opportunity that everybody can take away uh, from this process that we've been through. And I'll just draw your attention to maybe uh, two or three areas that you could also consider for yourselves in your own regions or parts of the world. If you look over on the, towards the top left hand corner there, uh, we've got zero waste commercial buildings. This is something that people were very passionate about, uh, something we can all do. You know, we can look to putting solar panels in. We can look to reducing the amount of waste in our offices. 
Uh, we can put recycling bins in. We can rebuild parts of our offices where they are not energy efficient and we can put new energy efficient installations in. So there's plenty we can do. Um, everybody can do it. If we go across to the uh, middle of the map, uh, the same kind of horizon, we've got accessible, low cost, low emissions transport. People were very uh, passionate about this. Uh, that can mean electric buses, which some regions of New Zealand have already gone into, electric scooters. We could actually take out all the car parks. We could remove the car parks here in New Plymouth. Um, we could take them out from anywhere else in the world. That will force people to actually think of an alternative form of method to get to work. It doesn't have to be in a car. You can come on an electric scooter or on a bike or even walk. And then finally, uh, the diversified sustainable land use. And we talked about, well, the Camerons have certainly talked about this earlier today. Uh, this is really important in the Taranaki region, but actually the whole of New Zealand, it is really, really important. Um, and we can use this. Thanks. Thank you. So if we look at the roadmap and we think about being Taranaki and we were to pick a couple of topics to dive into, I guess you'd look at food and fibre and energy as being cornerstones of our economy. Joanna, can you talk to those topics in relation to the roadmap? Sure, thanks, Grant. Well, I think just uh, building on for the sustainable land use, let's talk about food and fibre. You know, food and fibre is a fundamental part of the Taranaki economy. Something like $1.5 billion uh, per annum uh, comes out of the food and fibre industry and it, it employs over 10,000 people. We can't afford to lose it. But what people recognise through this process of building this vision was um, they want to really think very carefully about the land use, how we're using it, how we can keep it sustainable water usage, we heard about that again from the Camerons, in fact I think they've nearly written my speech. Um, you know, water is really important, how we use it, where we find it, what we do with it, it's really incredibly important. And for us, you know, everybody in this room, we all know about the plastic bag and the straw dilemma that we've been through, that's around food packaging, uh, that's really important and people are very passionate about that and what we're going to do in the future. And lastly, you know, the food processing. So we require in New Zealand a lot of high heat to be able to process our food, whether it be dehydrate uh, milk or whether it be to uh, sterilize products. We need some high heat and we've really got to think about, you know, how we can do this in the future if we're going to try to be uh, a low emissions economy. So uh, people were very passionate about it. I think the Camerons will be very pleased. One of the topics that came up was the fact that in New Zealand we do generate a lot of protein through uh, fish and meat and people are very interested in us looking to the future of what can we do uh, to look towards a protein based diet. Thanks. That's on the food and fibre. Um, the other area and one of the, some of the workshops that I went to and obviously being my background very passionate about was energy. Again energy uh, in Taranaki is incredibly important, uh, generates 28% of our GDP. Overwhelmingly, people wanted to keep Taranaki as an ener energy-based economy, but overwhelmingly, people accepted that we needed to diversify from what we have today. Yes, we can continue to reduce the emissions from the existing infrastructure that we've got, but what we've got to do is look at also alternative forms. People are very passionate about solar, and we know um, PV, uh, so photovoltaic panels are coming down in price, and people want to see uh, solar panels on their buildings. Wind. New Zealand has already proven that you can generate electricity from wind without having too many subsidies from the government, which is uh, something that's very unique. So we want to continue to build on that. Taranaki is a huge peninsula, we're surrounded almost, uh, on three sides anyway, uh, by water. So why can't we use wave and tide? Why can't we harness the energy from water? And it will be remiss of me not to also talk about hydrogen. Now hydrogen is going to be trialled here in Taranaki. And if that can be shown to be economic, that could also impact on the transport industry. People of Taranaki really want us to be an energy centre and it's great today that uh, Jacinda has uh, put out 
that we will have a new energy development center. I think it's going to be fantastic now that we can now develop these least four forms of new renewable energy to help us. Thank you. I think if you look at it and go, we've got a plan on how we're going to move forward, a really important component of this is the people. And it's something that's dear to your heart, Jen. So mm -hmm. do you want to tell us about the people and talent side of this? Sure, thank you. Um, so if you have a look at the map that's in front of you and you look at the bottom right, you'll see um, a river going into our Moana. And you'll see people in that river. And if you look right closely, you'll see two what look like youth or young workers um, working right at the edge of the wetland just there. Now, I love this. And I'll set the scene for you. Um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in my home country, my birth country, um, recently released a, a viral video where she talks from the future about how the American Green New Deal created high paying jobs, restoring wetlands and restoring our environment for people to transition to who were previously in higher emission jobs. But if we're going to make that sort of vision a reality here in Taranaki in 2050, that means we need to start transforming our education and training now in 2019. Um, so one of the strongest drivers for Taranaki 2050 efforts has been our Tamariki, our Mokupuna, our future generations. That's our driver. It's our youth. It's your planet. So I see young people in the map roadmap behind me learning about our natural world and getting the education and skills that they need to go into those kinds of meaningful, well-paid jobs in our region. You'll also see, as Fadi talked about, people, um, locals collecting Kaimoana in our clean green rivers, but they don't get there by magic. You have to actually have jobs so that people can restore our natural environment and keep it even cleaner and greener for the generations to come, which is exactly the kind of community we're starting to build. If you have a look at the roadmap right in the center below the RAN in Taranaki, in the middle, you'll see a bunch of idea light bulbs coming to life. That shows Taranaki becoming a hub for new energy and innovation. So it's quite good, um, the Prime Minister's announcement today, because that matches overwhelming feedback from the people who attended our hui. If we're going to become a hub for innovation and new energy, then that means that we need to be redesigning and transforming our education system now to support those efforts. So one of the other places right by the kids in the Awa, um, you'll see a school. I see Taranaki leading New Zealand by developing tertiary education processes and programs that the rest of our country will benefit from and that will help us advance our plans for this transition. So perhaps a tertiary outpost of a New Zealand university right here in Taranaki as well as, of course, supporting our existing training organizations and providers. It's, training and education is absolutely crucial. If we're going to retrain the workers, the working people currently in higher emissions jobs into new career pathways in a just and fair way, but it's also there to provide education and skills for our Tamariki and Mokopuna, who will be the working people of our future generations. We want them to be able to stay here in our region and make it even better. Thank you. I think if you look at the roadmap, and, and bear in mind this is a draft roadmap of where the Taranaki community has come together and said this is where we see ourselves in 2050. So I think the obvious question is, what happens next, Justine? Thanks, Grant. So as we talked about, this is a draft. Uh, we have an interactive tool on our website where people can go in and provide feedback on the different parts of the roadmap. There is a supporting report, so for those of you who like to read a report, you can go and read the report um, and provide feedback on that. We, all the feedback closes um, in the middle of June and then we will finalise the roadmap after that and following that we'll be working on the detailed action plans around those emerging pathways and then moving into um, projects probably in the year 2020. Thanks, Justin. The, the other thing, we talked about the five pillars, and an important component of the five pillars was central government, and where central government actually comes to the table. So, Gus, if you could let us know, what do you see as the role of central government in the path forward for Taranaki? Sure, yeah, kia ora um, So, 
So it's been a privilege um, partnering with Taranaki over the last year to do the roadmap work and the, the start of their transition planning. So the roadmap has been giving an opportunity for the Taranaki community to have a say in their future. And so what we've said is in the next phase of work, we'll be looking across all of the levers, programs, reviews and funding mechanisms that government has that might be able to support the objectives aspirations and the pathways that have been captured in that roadmap, roadmap process. So that's the really important partnership maki ahead of us. Thanks, Josh. And then I, I think if you look at it, and all of us who are involved in the lead group uh, and look at the roadmap, a really strong values context came out from the community. And Glenn, you're a, a strong part of that in terms of facilitating and leading. So do you want to talk to those values and the community aspect of the roadmap? Yeah, I, th I think as a process, uh, people were quite surprised coming into the room, um, expecting the good old um, deputation or consultation, um, suits behind a big desk, but uh, there were no suits, there were no desks, um, and people were actually quite startled by that, because they're used to uh, obviously adding their, their two cents worth to a decision that's already made. Uh, so the fact that they were able to co-create uh, was a huge, a huge part of that. I was part of four of the five community workshops, uh, and yeah, that really, really came out to me. I guess the thing uh, in terms of uh, seeing where we are going from here, um, we did have diversity in the rooms around our region, but there also were people missing uh, in that space, and I think we need to acknowledge that, and it's never a perfect process. Um, we're doing okay, but in terms of solo mums from Stratford or uh, yeah, unemployed men from Marfell or chicken workers, but I, I also see that uh, there, was, there was the potential and the opportunity that was there to support them um, as it comes back around. And I guess in terms of the, the next, next step is for us to be able to go out and consult and talk with our communities about what we want and what we dream of. But I also think that uh, people have really engaged and are engaging and are stepping up in terms of social media and people um, be being more active in their citizenship and not just waiting for government, whether it be local, uh, or central government to, to fix our problems, but us taking it into our own hands. But I have to say, I think us, MB, and uh, the Tanaki 2050 team, you might have set yourselves up a bit, um, because people are now engaged, <laughs> and people were excited, and people realize that the future is in their hands, and it's not about just delivering this report and it sort of being business as usual, but they want to be active and want to be part of the future. And I think uh, the Prime Minister said it really well uh, in her address this morning, that it's about no one being left behind. Mm -hmm. And I think as a community for us, it's how do we fight for this, that they're in this transition and no one is left behind. Thank you. Uh, has someone got the clicker? Mm. Apologies, I was meant to move through the odd slide. So as we move towards Taranaki 2050, I guess I, I'm, <coughs> I'd like to thank all of the panel and the lead group. The, the process itself has involved an incredible amount of volunteer effort by a lot of people, and that's come together to form the roadmap for Taranaki in 2050. Uh, what we'd like to do now is just look at some of the Slido questions, and the polling shall have given us one or two of these questions that have come up as being a priority focus. Um, now, do we have access to which of the top? Yeah, it's the rural, rural, okay. rural communities. Thank you. Rural communities. Thank you. Um, so the rural communities aspect was around how do you think this plan will support rural farming communities in Taranaki to become sustainable and rebuild rural populations again? And that was from Emily Bailey of Climate Justice Taranaki. And I think Wade, with a South Taranaki context, strong rural community, what are your perspective on that? Yeah, uh, thanks Grant. The, um, the key thing here is that a plan has been made and it's really easy sometimes in that for plans to be made and the thing just goes back on the shelf and you, you don't do anything more with it. So that can't be the case here. What we've got to make sure that we do is, is that we take this roadmap, we know that it's at a very broad um, roadmap um, at the moment. There's still some more detail to come around it um, in terms of its development. And then there's some uh, things that we as a council or local government will actually get involved with. I'll come to that in a moment. The other key aspect, I guess, um, in, in responding to this question is that um, it's not something that one agency or one 
uh, council or um, business or whatever can uh, necessarily do on their own. It needs to be a collaborative effort. Um, central government, uh, local government, uh, local government New Zealand are already doing quite a lot in this particular space and have climate change, for instance, as a, as a key priority of work that uh, they're looking to develop policy and that around as well. Here we need to be um, clearly involved um, here, community groups and even um, as uh, Jen has articulated through her discussion, our, our workforce and how we, in, how we engage through that. So perhaps just very quickly, just to provide you an, an example of what, um, what's happening at um, South Taranaki District Council, uh, we've already gone back out, uh, got ahead of the game a little bit more in terms of setting our, resetting our long-term plan, which will come up, the body of work will come up in a, another 12 months or so, but we've already gone back out, started doing community visioning work uh, for that next long-term plan uh, uh, with our community. And there are some key themes that are already clearly coming back in relation to that environment, uh, people, jobs, and those sorts of things are all clearly uh, starting to come back through that. So that'll start to set a bit of a, a plan for what we're doing in, in South Taranaki. Um, on top of that, um, uh, we've uh, decided to uh, get ahead of the game as ourselves as well internally. So currently we've got a position out for a new environmental sustainability management position to clearly start looking at these, this sort of work, climate change, waste minimisation, renewable energy, all of those sorts of things. By the way, the applications are still open, so <laughs> people in the room, you want to get on so online and have a look, at it's probably a bad advert, but anyway, um, get online and have a look. It's a really cool job, um, and uh, um, uh, we'll have a, lo a lot of change management process in, in that in front of it. Uh, so those are some of the sort of the key things that we're looking at at a local level. The, the, again, the key thing for us is to actually make sure that we articulate what it is that we're doing um, at a local level, engage with the community, communicate it, uh, get people involved, because it's not something that we can uh, clearly uh, do on our own and we need uh, support of, of others around it. The last point of that is how is it going to be funded? Um, there's only so much that ratepayers will uh, perhaps shell out for, but we've got to look at where we're heading, where, where does our council want to go in the future? Are there some things that we shouldn't do in the future and focus on our attention in other areas? So that'll be a conversation that our uh, community and councillors will have across the course of the coming months. Thank you, Will. Yep. Uh, the, the second most voted question is the one around how can we ensure that regional and national strategies are aligned, but also that they're continued across successive governments? So, Gus, it seems a logical question for you to pick up. Yeah, this is a really good question. It goes to my point earlier about the next phase of the work. So there are a whole bunch of reviews taking place across government uh, that will change systems, not least in education. And there are some real opportunities to make sure Taranaki's voice is heard in those reviews and that we're ensuring that we're meeting Taranaki's objectives with any changes we make. So that's, that's a commitment that the central government has made to make sure that we are bringing Taranaki's views and, and the rest of regional New Zealand's views into those national conversations. Um, we think by taking a systems view and getting those systems right, that will ensure that we are setting up Taranaki and other regional economies in an, on an enduring, um, strong enduring basis. Yep, thank you. Uh, we'll just pick up one last question and that's question number three around the mechanisms that we've put in place to ensure the core principles of the Treaty of Waitangi partnership, protection and participation are honoured and championed in Taranaki. Fadi, just it's like my question. <laughs> um, li listen, I, I mean, I think, I, I, and I know where that question's come from, but I, you know, I, I think it's sort of 1990s really, what, you know, we're, we're mana whenua, uh, we're tangata whenua, mm. uh, we're not going anywhere, huama. we've been here forever and we're going to be here forever. And, um, you know, I've, I know Lisa Tumohai, Naitahu CEO is in the, in the in the room and, and they've got a, I, I can't remember the exact wording Lisa but you've got they've got a very strong kōrero down there that you know any decisions down there must involve tangata whenua and not because we are tangata whenua or mana whenua or any of that sort of carry on but because um, we're going to add value and this kaupapa is you know when we look at the values we've talked about um, we're, we're as tribal people um, we have a lot of our people on the ground in, the, in those sort of rural communities, those small communities that have a voice. They're doing things on our rivers, they're, 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 they're white baiting and they're fishing and they want to ensure that that kai 
and let food sources available into the future. As everybody likes white bait, <laughs> everybody likes power and kina and good fish. You know, so um, I want to know that my my mokopuna, not just in 2050, uh, but in in 300 years time, in many generations, we'll still be able to enjoy what we have now. So. Um, you know, honouring the treaty and, and all of that stuff, you know, what, that there, there may be some of some people that are still having issues around the treaty. Well, get on with life. Get over it. Um, you know, this, uh, the treaty is what it is. We are, we are in a partnership here, mm. Māori and Pākehā. And also as Māori, we have a responsibility to look after our, our other communities that choose Aotearoa Taranaki as a place to live. They're always welcome. We will always manaki because that's our role. Uh, but as Tangata, when you are our voice, we're, we're all, um, they're, they're probably the final point, um, we're all post-settlement now. And we've all got a little bit of resource. Yes, we're a little bit lacking in capacity at times, but we want to be in those big decisions. And it's a bit of a challenge for us to step into those roles, uh, but we will be in those big decisions in terms of a future for Taranaki. Uh, we're many, we're, we're three waka, we're eight iwi, we're many marae and pā, but we are one maunga. That's all of us here. Ma. Kia ora tato. Thank you. Um, I think just in closing, Joanna, you had the responsibility of chairing the group, the lead group, and you did a fantastic job. Can you just give us a view from the chair to close out? Thanks, Grant. Well, I can say it was a real pleasure to chair the lead group because you've all done such a fantastic job, a uh, huge amount of hard work not only the lead group, but all the facilitators, and in particular, the two people I can just see down here at the front, uh, Natalie Wiseman and Caroline Gunn from Bench Taranaki, couldn't have done it without you. Anyway, that doesn't answer my question, but a huge thank you to all of you. Look, this design process has been fantastic. We've you know, engaged and tapped into the resources of around 1,000 people. And we've come up with what is a draft roadmap. And this draft roadmap shows the hearts and minds of the people of Taranaki and those that helped us externally of what they want to see for 2050, where we want to be at net zero carbon. We want to reduce our emissions. There was nobody that came to a workshop that thought any differently. Uh, but how are we going to get there, given it took us 150 years to get to where we are today, uh, how are we going to get there in the next 30 years? And we're going to need some support from the fossil fuels to assist us to allow us to be able to use renewable energies to keep ourselves as green as we can be. Uh, Glenn talked about some of the main aspects of um, people's desires around sustainability, having fantastic jobs, maintaining and improving for some people the lifestyle that we've got today. And we've got to keep those in the backdrop and remind ourselves as we go forward and think about what it is that our vision is. I will say though, uh, we've got 12 work themes. This is only a vision. There is a huge amount of work that we need to do now. Some of these activities that have been identified are totally aspirational. And it's great to have aspirations. Some of them will be uneconomic. We need to do the hard work now to look at the science, the data, the facts, the innovation, the technology, and very importantly, the economics of doing some of this to make sure that we can create affordable and renewable energy for a long time in New Zealand. So my challenge to you uh, is that it starts with all of us in this room. It's not just the people up here on the stage. I really want you to think about what you can do to get us to net zero carbon. And uh, just easily enough, all you need to do is think about how you got here today. What are you going to do tomorrow? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to our panel.